Okay, it's seven o'clock. Uh, Jim, are we live streaming this? We are. Okay. Uh. Okay. Glad you could make it tonight. For those of you that were expecting Pastor Josh, surprise, he's in Fort Worth, Texas at the uh, Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary uh, working towards his doctorate degree. He'll be back Friday, I think. Anyway, he'll be back for the worship service Sunday. So we certainly need to to pray for him as he drove out there was driving back Um, this is called prayer meeting wonder why because we gather to pray um and uh, hopefully you picked up a sheet that Donna made for us. Um, Wednesday night prayer meeting updated today. And it's got new prayer requests on here. Uh, William Bullard taken to Cape Fear Valley today. The family of Marilyn Bullock. And I don't know. And what's the prayer request? I mean, did she pass away? She passed away. Okay. She passed away. Okay. And then the family of Leroy Register, Virginia Bullard's brother. The family of William Love Hughes, Donald's uncle. Helen Rogers with Agape. Uh, I think, yeah, she's been to our church and spoken before. She has colon cancer. She's had surgery. I guess she's at home now. And I understand that Caroline Ackerman had a heart catheterization yesterday. And Donna said she thought things went well. And uh, hopefully she won't have to have any heart surgery or anything in in the near future. Yeah. Well, that's a praise. So uh, we want to thank the Lord for that. And uh, Barbara Melvin is, is back in the nursery. And she asked us to pray for Wanda Averett. Um, Wanda just has absolutely no energy. And she said they're changing her medications. And I don't know if that's a part of it or, or what. But uh, we need to pray for Wanda. And then I mentioned about praying for Josh. Now, other prayer requests that you have tonight that we haven't already mentioned here? Rose? We've been praying for him quite a while ago, yeah, yeah. remember? Yeah. Shane West. I'm looking to the top. Okay. Other prayer requests? Remember the Dockery family? They laid their nine year old daughter Genesis, the one that was shot to rest today. What family was it? The Dockery. The Does anybody know how much money we took up Sunday for the family? Eleven or twelve hundred. Thank the Lord for that. Okay. Uh, and uh, who else had a hand raised? Michelle. Her name is Jane. 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 Jane.
Genesis. The little girl on uh, Genesis. With the J. She's like the fourth one down for continued prayers. <coughs> um, yes, please continue to pray for my grandma. She had her fall over a month ago. They sent her to the hospital and they sent her to the rehab facility and she came home. Um, she quickly, in just one or two days, she fell again um, because she did have that stroke that affected her. And she's falling when she's trying to pull her pants up. And that's when she's falling in the bathroom. So she fell and didn't hurt herself too bad. But then she fell again the next day, and she did. She cracked her ankle. Um, and she has a big you know, bruise on her head. So she's back in the hospital. Um, we'll have to go back to rehab again. So if you have a new prayer request, put it on a share card. Yeah, make sure Michelle gets it. <clears throat> okay? Any other prayer requests? Uh, Steve? <clears throat> Your what? Your breathing. Okay. Thank the Lord for that. Okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, I'll share with you this morning as I was having my prayer time. And I've shared with you before. Uh, what should you start your prayer time with? See if anybody remembers. Praise, okay, okay, yeah, um, that's really encouraging when you remember that, even more so if you do it, and in, uh, in Psalm 27 verse 8 it says, this is David says to the Lord, when thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek, and that relates to just offering praise to the Lord. And uh, it's been a while since I've been with you on Wednesday night, but uh, if you recall, one of the things that I've gotten into a habit, and I encourage you to do the same thing, is start your prayer time with an open book, with your Bible open. And this morning, <coughs> uh, as I came into the Lord's presence, I offered him praise from uh, Psalm 33. And I'm just going to share with you. I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, and, and when I'm praying, I mean, I've got my eyes open. And I'm saying, Lord, I'm going to your word to offer you praise from your very word. And I'm paraphrasing this. I mean, it, it, in verse 4, it says, For the word of the Lord is right and all his works are done in truth. So when I pray this back to the Lord in offering praise to him, I said, for your word, O Lord, is right. And your works are done in truth. You loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of your goodness. By your word, Lord, were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of your mouth. You gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. You layeth up the depths in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. What beautiful words of praise. And they're right here. Praise comes out of a thankful heart. You heard me say that before. And uh, 
so when we start our prayer time we offer praise to him before we seek his hand we seek his face and offer him praise and uh, we've just done that through the reading of uh, psalm 33 so let's go to the lord in prayer now and, and seek his hand father in god we come to you because you are the great and wonderful God that we love and we serve. Father, you are worthy of our praise. May we never cease to praise you and thank you, Lord. Father, we seek your hand right now as we pray for William Bullard that they've had to take him back to the hospital uh, and it seemed like he was making uh, some progress a little bit each day and uh, father we pray that uh, this setback uh, is something that you will use you will give him a special grace and strength to overcome and be back home soon we do pray for the families of Marilyn Bullock and Leroy Register and William Love Hughes. Father, we pray that you would wrap your loving arms around these dear ones that are hurting because of the loss in their family. We do pray for Helen Rogers. Um, this colon cancer we thank you for the surgery we pray oh lord that you give the doctors wisdom uh, in how to proceed from here father we would just pray for a healing touch for her from you and we thank you we unite our hearts in thanksgiving uh, thanking you for the good news concerning caroline and this heart catheterization and the fact that uh, she's not looking at, at heart surgery anytime soon. We thank you for the progress that she's making, Lord. We do pray for Wanda tonight. Uh, Lord, give her strength, give her energy, and give the doctors wisdom as they change her medications. Father, we would pray for Josh as he's fully engaged in working on his doctorate degree. And Father, when he begins his uh, return trip home, we pray, pray that you would give him safety, uh, there'd be no accidents or incidents involved. Father, you'd give him a special time of fellowship just between him and you in this long ride. We do pray for uh, the Dockery family. Lord, we can only imagine the impact of this tragedy of losing this child. Uh, Father, we know that you have a special grace just for times like this. And we would pray for a full measure of your grace upon this family. Lord, may they turn to you and not away from you in this time of mourning. Lord, we join Michelle in praying for her grandma that has fallen again um, Lord we pray for Michelle's mother and pray that uh, you would help her grandmother with her balance and be so careful uh, whenever she takes steps thanks for Steve and his breathing being better Lord each one of us have something to be thankful for tonight something to praise you for and we just thank you for this special time of prayer and Lord as we leave here and we go through the rest of the week we pray that you would bring to our minds and our hearts those that you would have us pray for at just the right time in Jesus name Amen <coughs> Okay, <clears throat> let's get down to the study of the Word. Um, 
and we're looking at the the church in Pergamos in Revelation 2 12 through 17 so if you haven't already turned there please do so and follow along <coughs> He said you were not having choir practice tonight, so maybe I'll be able to finish this. Uh, we're going to look at this verse by verse and, and dig into this. These, these few verses of Scripture are so rich in the truth. <coughs> and it's one thing... <coughs> excuse me. It's one thing to read the Word and we all know that we need to read the Word. Uh, but it's another thing to read the Word and to ponder on the Word, to meditate on the Word, to study the Word, to think about the Word, because when you do that, you allow the Holy Spirit the freedom to reveal things to you, truth that you need in your life, truth that will renew your mind and, and change the way you think and, and transform you as a believer. So, um, the church at Pergamos. Um, and I had never really taught on the, the letters to the church, to the seven churches. And so, I'm sort of coming in on the middle of a movie. Josh has already gone over with you about uh, the first two churches. Uh, so, you know, if I say something uh, that he's already covered, please forgive me. If I say something that contradicts him, then go tell Josh, hey, Gary said something different. Of no, I'm just kidding you. Uh, it was, uh, this church was identified as the faltering church. The faltering church, that's an unusual term. And what do you think that's meant by that? The faltering church. They were what? Going astray. You're absolutely right. And they were going astray because worldliness and carnality was creeping into the church. Um, in other words, there were people in the church that were compromising with the world. Uh, they were seeking a comfortable compromise with the world. Now, what do you think that means? A comfortable compromise with the world. Okay. Uh, that's a great point, Mike. I don't know. Can y'all hear Mike? when he was talking see that's the problem when we got people spread out all over the the sanctuary here you in the back probably didn't hear what he said because his back is turned to you uh, but a comfortable compromise well the the world really is, is by definition by biblical definition is everything that opposes God so when you seek a comfortable compromise with the world then you're seeking something that is not in accordance with God's word. And we, we look at this in, in terms of righteousness. And I have beat that horse to death. If you were in the class that I did in VBS about trials. We talked about that extensively. And anybody remember what righteousness is? It's a word we see all throughout scripture. And the more that I study scripture. The more I realize just how key and essential our understanding of this word is. Anybody know? Barbara, you don't remember? You're right, Iris. It's con uh oh. She's got it written down. Uh, it's conforming our lives to the Word of God or the will of God. Conforming to everything that God commands and appoints in His Word. In other words, we live the truth that God reveals to us. Now, if 
if you're conforming yourself to the world, if you're seeking a, a comfortable uh, situation in your life with the world, what you've actually done is you've reduced God down to a level that you feel comfortable with. One that allows you to do things not according to God's Word. If you conform your, your life to the world, then it's not righteousness, it's what? Self-righteousness. It's self-righteousness. You've heard that term before, haven't you? Okay. Um, and of course we know in, in Romans 12 too, it says, and don't be conformed to the world. Don't look to the world for your righteousness. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the transforming power of the truth that the Spirit reveals to you as you think and ponder and meditate upon the Word. Okay. So, uh, in other words, people in, in the church in Pergamos, they had one foot in the church and one foot in the world. And that's why they call it a faltering church. Now, does the church today have that problem? Every church has that problem. All of us struggle with that. There's no perfect church, right? If there was a perfect church, that wouldn't be a problem. Okay, now let's go to our first verse here. Uh, Revelation 2.12 And the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. So who's talking here? Look at your Bible. Jesus. Is it in red letters? Yeah. Jesus is talking here. And uh, who is he talking to? Who? Uh, no. No. He's talking to John, who was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. And he's saying, John, write these things. Everything that I'm fixing to tell you, you write. And who's he writing it to? To the church in Pergamos. But he says, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos, right? So, yeah, ultimately, he wants it in the church. Uh, but here he's saying, write these things to the angel of the church. Now, did Josh explain to you the angel of the... What, just out of curiosity, what did he say? Bingo! Okay, because in a biblical sense, angel is messenger, but in the context here, it's one that oversees God's plan in the church. And, and working of the plan in the church. Uh, if you go back and look at the, the Greek word angel in the context here, it talks about messenger or a bishop or the presiding elder. So in a sense you could say, Jesus is saying to John, write these things to Josh for the people at Beaver Dam Baptist Church. Okay? You think we ought to pay attention to this? I mean, it's coming straight out of the mouth of Jesus. And it says, These things saith he, Jesus, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. The sharp sword with two edges. Anybody have an idea as to what that means? It cuts both ways. It cuts every way. There is no escaping it. Uh... This, this refers to divine justice. It's words of judgment that comes out of the mouth of, of Jesus Christ. And we're talking about a time here in Rome. And to the Romans, this, this uh, image of a sword uh, was a, a, a powerful image of justice to them. So Christ is described here. As, as one that's having this sharp sword with two edges that can cut even deep into the soul of men. 
And uh, this goes back, uh, it's referenced in Isaiah 11, 1 through 4, and you'll recognize some of this. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Who do you think it's talking about? And shall make him a quick under, of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. So who's it talking about? Come on now. If you say Jesus, 90% of the time you're going to be right. It's talking about Jesus here. And uh, he's the only one that's qualified to judge. He's the one that God has given the authority and the power to judge. So he doesn't judge after the sight of his eyes, nor reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness. There's that word again righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth with the sword of his mouth with two edges and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked so out of the mouth of Jesus Christ will come words of judgment and what's the basis of that judgment righteousness When you're reading through Scripture, I mean, these are the kinds of questions you need to stop. Take your time when reading the Word uh, and ask yourself, okay, what's he talking about there? And if you've, if you've got a, uh, a Hebrew-Greek key study Bible with uh, lexicon in it for the Old Testament and the New Testament, you can go and look these words up. And it tells you exactly what I'm telling you as far as what righteousness is. Uh, okay. Now, uh, so let's move on to verse 13. He says, I know thy works. And you find this in all of the seven letters to the churches. I know thy works. How does he know the works? What's he talking about here? Who's a thy? I know thy works. Is he talking about the church in Pergamos? Oftentimes I think we, um, we uh, distance ourselves from the church. In other words, when, when it makes reference to the church, we're thinking, oh yeah, Beaver Dam Baptist Church. But we don't stop to realize he's talking about the people in the church. He's talking about you and I here. So instantly when you hear the, the word church, you need to think me. He's talking to me. I know thy works. And he knows our works because he is Jehovah Shammah. That's one of the names of God. It means he sees, he hears, and he knows. He's with us now. So, um, he says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest. Ooh, does that mean your address? Does he know your home address? Yeah. But, uh, he says, even where Satan's seat is. Now, anybody read that? Do you know what that means? Why did he say that? Satan's seat. I know where you dwell. I know your works, and I know where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is. So really, what he's saying is, you're living where Satan's seat is. And I'll explain that to you in a second. But first, I know where you dwell. Uh, I know where you live. I know the environment and the culture that you have to live in. Okay? And you'll, you'll see why that's, that's so important. Uh, he says it's where Satan's seat is. Now why, why did he associate that with 
uh, Pergamos. Uh, well, it's like Satan's hometown. It's, it's where the seat of his power is. So, in understand, in the time that he's addressing here, you had Rome that was at the height of her glory and power. And during this time, and of course they were a, a pagan society, you talking about immoral, ungodly, that was them. But then, there's a new sect of people that has come onto the scene here. What are they called? Starts with a C. Christians! Amidst this pagan culture, now you have Christians that come on the scene. Are they different? Yeah, a lot. Should be a lot different. Um... Uh, and they don't do the things. They don't subscribe to the things of this pagan culture. They're different. And they don't agree with it. So, uh, imagine that. Being different from the world. Is that a new concept? No. That goes right back to Romans 12 too. And don't be conformed to the world. <clears throat> and here, they were not conformed to the world. Not all of them. But some of them were conformed to the world. And therein lies the problem. So they refused to conform to this godless society in Rome. And the reason it was called Satan's seat is because of the Roman tribunal. From the very highest levels in government. They decided that they were going to stamp out this new sect of people called Christians. They were going to drive them out. Because they were disturbing their pagan culture. They were creating some problems. And they thought that they could control the people's conscience by law. So, they made it illegal to be different in thought, in word, and in deed. Don't you say anything against our pagan culture. Uh, does that remind you of anything? Back when we had COVID, for people that, that, that did not have peace in their heart about taking the COVID-19, what did the government say? They put their boot on the necks of people and caused them to lose their jobs because they wouldn't yield for the power of the government in our lives. They were nonconformist. The, these faithful followers in the church of Pegamus. <clears throat> and it was the greatest uh, area. Uh, and, and Satan, uh, he was at the root of this hatred for Christians. And it was more so, the persecution was more so here than anywhere else in the world. And that's why he's referring to this as even where Satan's seat is. And you see down at the bottom there, he says, Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Where Satan dwelleth. And he makes reference to Antipas. Anybody know anything about Antipas? He's a faithful martyr. Uh, and I don't know, I mean, we're not told a lot about him, but the tradition has it that he was roasted alive because he refused to renounce his faith and, and, and conform to the pagan culture. This is a picture of what they refer to as a brazen bull. And uh, it was made out of bronze. It was in the shape of a bull. And you see the one door there. And here they're forcing somebody inside the bull. And you see, you probably can't tell it from this, but they had a fire <clears throat> under this brazen bull. And they would heat it up. And the person inside would, would roast to death from the heat. And they had... Uh, and some sort of an acoustic apparatus in there 
whereby whenever the person inside screamed, it was transformed into the sound of a bull. If you can imagine that. So, um, the hatred for Christians was more prevalent in, in uh, Pergamos than anywhere else. That's, that's the reason it says that's where Satan dwelleth. Now, um, there's, uh, there's three things that Jesus knows. He says, I know thy works. We just talked about the first one. That being, I know where you dwell. And I know the circumstances you're living under. And how you've been threatened if you don't conform to their culture. And how you've been persecuted. I know that. And then the second thing is, thou holdest fast my name. What do you think that means? They were a faithful witness to the Lord Jesus. Even in the face of, of persecution. And in the midst of this satanic hatred for Christians, they were unashamed of their faith. And they lived out their faith. They let Christ live the, his life through them. Even in the face of, of not only persecution, but being martyred. And then the, the third thing is, it says, I know. You've not denied my faith. And when, it, when Jesus says my faith, he's talking about the Christian faith or the faith that you have in me. That's what he's referring to. You haven't denied that. <clears throat> and this speaks about their endurance in persecution. You haven't relented. You haven't given in to. You have endured and you're going to see the word that we use later is you have overcome. A key word in this study. Okay, so the three things that Christ says, you write to them and tell them, I know what it's like. The, uh, the, the great precepts and the doctrine that they had of the faith, it was in good hands with the faithful ones in the church at Pergamos. But not everybody was faithful. Because in verse 14, he says, But I know thy works, but I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Now, there's a lot there. But, do what? Uh, <laughs> is that like an amen? Okay. I like amens. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I have a few things against thee. Well, why? Why does he have a few things against them? Why? Come on, look at the verse. Why? It tells you, because. Okay, You're, you must have been reading ahead. <laughs> Good. You get a smiley face, Mike. <clears throat> okay. Uh, in other words, they're holding to the doctrine of Balaam. There's some in the church. You know, they got one foot in the church and one foot in the world. And uh, this doctrine of Balaam, if you remember from Scripture, this was a Gentile prophet. I mean, he was a scoundrel. And he was fixated on what Mike alluded to, on money and women. And the Jews considered him a false teacher. And you remember the story, he consulted Balak. <clears throat> Balak wanted him to come because the, the Israelites were coming. Uh, they were bringing the, the war to them. And so Balak wanted to secure the services of Balaam to come and curse the Israelites. God wouldn't let him do it. And because of 
Balaam's corrupt mind, he goes back to Balak and, and it says to cast a stumbling block. You know what a stumbling block is? It's a trap. It's an enticement or an occasion leading to conduct or behavior, uh, bringing with it ruin to the person. So what he's telling King uh, Balak, king of Moab, he says, you know, there's another way we skin this cat. Uh, God's not going to let me curse the Israelites. But why don't you do this? Why don't you encourage, promote, nurture idolatry and immorality amongst the people? Especially at these religious festivals. And when you do that, and they do that, and they, you know, uh, conform to, to that in practice and whatnot, what do you think God's going to do? Well, the king wanted ba Balaam to come and curse the Israelites. So, if this is a different strategy, if it works, what do you think God's going to do? He's going to curse the people. He's going to bring his wrath and his judgment upon the people. So this guy Balaam figured out, hey, we can get to the same end result here. We're just going around our elbow to get there. So, encourage idolatry and fornication. And this is the doctrine that was creeping into the church at Pergamon. People were actually holding to this. And, and they were saying like you know it's okay uh, you know as long as we worship on Sunday we can do this on Monday or or whatever um, and and the people were getting into a mindset of separating worship and these pagan activities <clears throat> So they were beginning to conform to, to the godless society, especially in the religious festivals. And that was the stumbling block. And Balaam was responsible for that. And now you've got people in the church that are embracing that. It's all right. In fact, it's our civic duty to, to be like the Romans, you know, in a sense to be true Romans. Oh, yeah, I get so sick. I, I've heard, you know, places, place where I work, or not Carolina College of Biblical Studies. I've never heard this there. But at the, the real estate office and different places, mothers actually tell me that uh, I ask them, how's your daughter doing? You know, I know she graduated from Carolina. She's a pharmacist. How's your daughter doing? Well, she's doing good. Her boyfriend's moving in with her this weekend. Like, no big deal. That's the thing to do today. And she claims to be a Christian. Something wrong there. Okay. I can barely hear you, Greg. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a fascinating story. And you can talk yourself anything that you want to talk yourself. You can justify it. It's like I told Pastor Josh before he left. I said, people do whatever they want to do. They do whatever they want to do. And, and if their lives are not <coughs> aligned, conformed with the Word of God, They'll justify it in a heartbeat and not think anything about it. Okay, uh, I'm going to have to hurry here or, or we're not going to finish. And this, uh, talking about this, it reminds me in the book of Malachi, 
Sometime I want to teach the book of Malachi. It's probably the closest thing, parallel to the mess that we're in in our nation today. But uh, God brought Malachi onto the scene. The nation of Israel, they had spiraled down into the depths of depravity over 50 years. And you look at America and where we are now versus the last 50 years. And people had profaned the worship of God. And they looked at the, those that had conformed to the world and what they had and what they were doing. And they, they said, why am I doing this? Why am I going for, to, to worship? Look at what he's got. Look at what he's doing. And I don't see any repercussions. You see that convoluted thinking? That's the kind of thinking that had crept into the church. That's right. You remembered from Deuteronomy. that such an unwise generation, God told Moses, because they don't consider the latter end. Okay, and for some people it's going to be too late. Now, uh, verse 15. So hast thou... So, also, so, thou, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Jesus hates it. That and, and the doctrine of Balaam as well. And really when you study this, I don't have time to go into detail, but basically it parallels uh, the doctrine of, of Balaam and, uh, and what we talked about there. Now, the Ephesian church, if you remembered when, when Josh went over that with you, the, the first letter to the church, at Ephesus, they were, they were commended for identifying and oppose, opposing this heresy. But the church at, at Pergamos, not so. They were tolerating it. They were glossing over it. They were saying, no big deal. You know, we'll do our thing. Let them do their thing. Rationalize it away. Don't make a big deal. Don't rock the, the boat. And that's part of the reason why God is writing this letter. To bring it to their attention. I mean, this was like a cancer that was growing in the church. And if you don't cut it out, what happens? It'll overtake the body. And the body will, will die. Okay. Okay. So, here you have sort of the, the backdrop uh, with, with where they live and what they were experiencing and whatnot. And then in verse 16, the Lord says, repent. And what does that word mean? Turn around. Uh, if you look at it, um, that word in, in the Greek, it's a little more, it adds some clarity it says, repent with regret for the consequences of your actions accompanied by a true change of heart towards God. You might repent and you're sorry for getting caught in what you've done and for the problems it's caused, but if there's not a true change of heart toward God and your relationship with God, it's not repentance. It's not true repentance. So, he says, um, repent or else. Now, he's talking to the church here, uh, as well as, you know, the members of the church at Pergamos, as well as us, members of the church at Beaverdam Baptist Church. He says, repent or else, I will come unto thee quickly. And will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Remember that two-edged sword that cuts every way you turn? Uh, he says, I'll come quickly. And uh, it's like he's giving them a choice. Either you deal with it or I deal with it. And it reminds me of the billboard. I hadn't seen them in a, in a while, but they used to have a billboard. It was God talking. And he says, don't make me come down there. And in a sense, that's what Jesus is saying here. Don't make me come down there. Because if I have to deal with it, it's not going to be pretty. It's going to be drastic. Now, 
this is really referring both to, to present judgment upon the church. If we've got this going on in our church, we need to deal with it. Enough said about that. Now, and not only the judgment in the present uh, church, but judgment at the second coming. At the second coming. When every one of us, I say every one of us, everyone that has a genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ will stand before Jesus with these eyes of fire. The one that knows all of our works. We will stand before him one day and we will have to give an account of what we have done to build up the body. Not tear it down. Not manipulate it. Not deceive it. But to build it up. Okay, that's a whole other lesson in itself. Uh, so... In, uh, in verse 17, there's a prophetic warning here. He says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Now, who's he talking to here? All of us. The church. He that hath an ear. Now, is he saying, you know, listen to what I'm telling you guys. Listen up, church. No, it's much more forceful than that. When he uses the word hear, and in some translations, you may see the word beseech. It's a much more forceful term. And, and if you look at this word in the Greek, the word hear, it means to listen with the intent to obey. I mean, he's got your attention. And whatever he says, you plan to do it. So he says, he that hath an ear, let, uh, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saying, He that receiveth it. Okay, we need to unpack this a little bit. To him that overcometh. Now, um... Okay. The word overcometh here. The overcomer here. In this Roman pagan culture that the Lord is addressing. Is different than the overcomer that John mentions in 1 John. It's a different word. It's a different meaning. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith and what he's saying here by virtue of the fact that you have a genuine faith in Jesus Christ you have overcome the world you have you have been saved from the penalty of sin who is, who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the son of God so here again this word believeth is the same word as faith and it's this word pistis. I drew this for you in our uh, course on, uh, on trials. Because what's the purpose of trials? Why does God bring or allow trials into the life of the believer? To test your faith and to strengthen your faith. You're right. To test your faith. And here, by definition... If you look up the word pistis in the Greek, <clears throat> this is what it says. It implies the knowledge of, the assent to, and the confidence in certain divine truths, especially those of the gospel, as produces good works. <clears throat> you can have the knowledge, and you can say, yeah, I agree with it, but if you don't have enough confidence in it, that it's manifested by good works, these works that God ordained for the believer before the foundations of the world, if you're not conforming your life, living your life to what God tells us in His Word, accompanied by these good works, 
I'm not saying you have to have good works for salvation. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has everything to do with whether or not you have a genuine faith. Because if you have a genuine faith, it's going to be manifested in the good works. Remember what James said? Faith without works is what? It's dead. You're right, Dorothy. It's a dead faith. Okay, so in 1 John, he's saying, <clears throat> you've overcome by the fact that you have faith. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But now we go back to here, and it says, to him that overcometh, it's a different word here. Will I give, I mean a different meaning. <clears throat> will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone. Now, uh, this word overcome, it goes back to endurance. It goes back to persecution. And where Jesus said, you hold fast to my name, to my faith. In other words, you haven't given in. You haven't conformed your life to, to the world, to the pagan culture in those days. You conformed it to God's word. Does that mean we'll always be perfect? No. But whenever we mess up, as we all do, as we all have, as we all will, then what happens? The thought we should be some repentance there, the true change of heart towards God. God will come and put us back on track. <clears throat> okay. Um, now, in the few minutes that I have left, real quickly, he says, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. This is really talking about, in the, the church then, the church now, it, it's talking about revelations of Jesus Christ. Things that are hidden from the world. Only we know those things as revealed by the Spirit of God. And not only today, but in the, the heavenly manna that is to come. <clears throat> He says, I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written. Now, what in the world does that mean? What is the significance of that? Do what, Mike? Okay, a pillar of the temple. Uh, yeah, I, I've seen that. You know, some scholars, they... Um, they have differing opinions when it comes to this. They, and I looked at a number of them, and the, the consensus seems to believe that this white stone in that day, in a trial, you had jurors, <coughs> and if they put in a white stone, then they were acquitting the man. If they put in a black stone, they were condemning. <coughs> and that's the picture that you have here. He's, and the Lord says, I'll give you this hidden manna. Now, and you'll get more later, and uh, I'll give you a white stone with a new name written in the white stone. And this makes reference to Isaiah 62, 2. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, in which the mouth of the Lord shall name. And from what I can gather, this refers to a personal name. You know, whenever you, if you're adopted into a family, normally you take the name of that family. And that relates to this. But it's a name that Jesus gives us. And it's written here. Now, what would be the significance of it? Well, I take you back. How do you interpret Scripture? With Scripture. That's the best way to interpret. So let's go back and look at what he said. Because in each one of these letters, there's something there that he gives to those that overcome it. And in Ephesus, I'll give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So where do you see this happening? Tree of life, in the midst of the paradise of God? Heaven. In Smyrna, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And I know Josh went over this with you. The second death at the end of the thousand year reign when those that are not true believers, those that do not have a genuine faith, will stand 
before Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment before cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Are we going to be there? I hope not. We won't be hurt by the second death. Where will we be? In heaven. So, in Ephesus, in heaven. Smyrna, in heaven, for those that overcome it. And share one more. Thyatira. I'm not sure I pronounced that right. I didn't look it up. Uh, it says, He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And who is it that's going to rule with the Lord? We are in heaven. I'll give, uh, he says, it's interesting here, that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. Did we miss that? Him that overcometh, him that perseveres and keepeth my works, that does the good works that I have for them, that conforms their lives to the everything that God commands or appoints to us in His Word, that has a genuine faith, and out of that faith comes these good works. And who is it that does the works? Does it depend upon us to do them? Not according to Philippians 2.13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good will. Whenever you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, whether you realize it or not, what you were saying was, the commitment that you made, was Jesus, because you sacrificed your life for my life, I'll let you live your life through me. That's the commitment that you made. You were saying, I'll conform my life to your word, to every word that, that comes out of your mouth. And let you live through me. So that other people can see that. So that you can use me as an instrument of your grace. And how is it that we can do this? With the, the pull of the world and, and all that we've talked about. Well, we can do it because if you've got a genuine faith in Christ, we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. That salvation that's culminated when we stand before Christ one day, ready to be revealed in the last time. We're kept by the power of God. If we get off track, God can put us back on track. Well, what does that say about the, the member of the church? And if you look at our church roles, about half of them probably inactive. Uh, and I'm, we're not in a position to judge. The Bible warns us against that. But the only thing we can say is there's something wrong with the heart there. And um, anyway, that's another lesson by itself. Um, and this is what I was talking about to you. It says, unto the end. Keep my works unto the end. Well, when is the end? This doesn't relate to time. This relates to you me and what God wants to do in our lives. What He called us to do. The good works that He has for us to do. The character and the conduct that He wants us to have. That's why He tests our faith. Because He's making us into the image of His dear Son. And uh, good Lord willing, beginning the first Sunday in September, I'm going to start a discipleship class. It's called Design to Be Like Him. Amazing learning. God designed us to be just like His Son. Okay. Uh, unto the end. The end there is when God accomplishes what He wants in our lives. It's, it's His end in mind. It's the end state for us. And our spiritual growth and our character and our conduct. Okay. Um, so, the white stone, the manna, these are rewards. This is like saying, here, you have this white stone. 
you're not guilty. You can now have access to the marriage feast of the Lamb. You'll be able to wear the white robe. You will enjoy what God has for you for an eternity in heaven. For those that overcome, for those that persevere, for those that conform their lives, for those that do the works that God has called them to do. Okay, I'm six minutes over. I'll try to do better. Any questions? Comments? Did you learn anything? Yes. Well, then say amen. 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 Isn't it refreshing when you dig into the truth of God's Word and the Spirit reveals things to you? What, Joanne? Oh. Well, uh, yeah. Back, uh, I've told you before, you know, the Lord had me teaching children for 15 years or more before he elevated me to adults. And I'm not the same teacher I was uh, 55 years ago. That's probably a good thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was scared to death to teach these children. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to... Anyway, I, the Lord had me in the wilderness teaching children, you know, for 15 years before he elevated me to adults. Like Moses in the wilderness for 40 years. He says, okay, now, okay, I got you where I want you. Now I want you to start teaching adults. And, uh, you know, anyway, uh, I'll be forever grateful. For the truth that God has revealed to me, and I've often said, uh, that's one reason why I think God brought Rita and I to Beaver Dam Baptist Church to share with you the truth that God is revealing to me. And I count it a joy and a privilege to share with you tonight. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the truth that your spirit has ministered to our hearts. Lord, may we embrace that truth May it continue to ring in our minds and our hearts. Lord, may the desire for that truth ever grow stronger. For we pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, I'm sorry I kept you eight minutes over.